And we're recording. I'm here. My name is Arlie Sorg. I am co-editor-in-chief of Fantasy Magazine, among other things. That's the most important thing for this. And I'm here with Wendy N. Wagner, who is awesome, amazing, um, and she is editor of Nightmare Magazine. Wendy, do you want to say anything about yourself? Uh, I don't know if there's much else to know. I mean, I'm a writer and editor and I live in the Pacific Northwest and I'm just happy that I get to work with Arlie all the time. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> um, so how did you originally get involved in the SFF community and how did you initially get involved with Lightspeed and Nightmare? Well, there's kind of a little bit of overlap between those. Um, you know, I always wanted to be like a fantasy writer. And in my 20s, I spent a lot of time like writing novels, like doing NaNoWriMo and stuff like that. And I felt like I wasn't improving very quickly. And I thought writing short stories might help me. But at the time, I didn't really like short stories that much. And oh, wow. it seemed like kind of a struggle. And one day I was at the library and I picked up like a, a horror anthology. And I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> I really love reading horror stories. Like I, it's suddenly like, I was like, oh yeah, the first horror book I ever read was like, uh, you know, Stephen King skeleton crew. And yeah. I just started devouring all of these like, horror stories and I was like writing all these stories for anthology calls and I was getting a little bit better slowly um and I picked up this book at the library it was called The Living Dead and it was this anthology by this guy named John Joseph Adams and it blew me away because here was somebody who was like basically the same age as me who is already putting together all these books and I could follow him on Twitter. Right. <laughs> um, and it just so happened to be that this was like 2009 and he put out a call for original stories for a book called the way of the wizard, which is a mix of reprints and originals. And he had like four, four or five slots in that book that he was opening to like, um, like a, an open call. I think he said he got like 900 stories for that, that little opening. And my, I was like, this guy is my hero. I love his stuff. I'm going to write a story for that. Even though it wasn't horror, which had kind of like become my obsession for a little while, it was still fantasy. And so it was something I was interested in. <laughs> and so I sent it in. And um, kind of at the same time, I was getting to know a lot of other people on Twitter and I met Christy Yant, who is now Arlie's co-editor yeah. at Fantasy Magazine. And she was like, I sent in a story too. And I just met this guy at a uh, World Fantasy Convention and this John Joseph Adams guy, he's the real deal. He's really cool and nice. I'm gonna be one of his editorial assistants on, for like this magazine he's gonna start. And I was like, that sounds cool. <laughs> and both of us got stories accepted into the way of the wizard. It was so exciting and so great. Cause it was the first time I sold a story to like, you know, a, a real market okay. that paid more yeah. than five cents a word, you know? Yeah. And it was like so cool. And, and I mean, like, you know, Neil Gaiman has a story in that. And, you know, it's like, I'm in a book with Neil Gaiman. Oh my God. <laughs> it was so exciting. And um, so Christy had originally kind of signed up to be an editorial assistant, like to help with the headers in The Way of the Wizard. But because she was also being an editorial assistant at Lightspeed, which hadn't even had its first issue yet, but oh, you know, wow. as Arlie knows, just because the magazine isn't publishing work yet, doesn't mean that it, the work isn't ongoing, right? There's a uh, lot to do. <laughs> right. So um, I said, well, you know, if, John, if you think John Joseph Adams would work with me, I mean, he seemed so nice when he did the edits on my story. Uh, I had to revise that story twice before he accepted it. It was very stressful. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, I said, well, I could maybe help out. And so I wrote some story headers for that. And then uh, JJA and I worked together on a couple of reprint anthologies where I did a lot of reading of works that he would send me and we'd talk about if it seemed right for the theme and stuff like that. And it was so fun working with him. I just loved it. 
Um, and eventually, like, he needed an assistant editor when he took over Fantasy Magazine, and I did that for a year. Um, and when that, that magazine wound up being folded back into Lightspeed for a long time, until you guys brought it back from the dead, which was awesome. <laughs> uh, well, not really back from the dead, more like back from a sleep. Yeah, it was right. dormant. <laughs> only, it is not dead, but only sleeping. <laughs> we, woke, we woke the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> but then, um, you know, like, I was like, oh, I don't want to go work at Lightspeed. I already have all the people they could possibly use. So, and I was like writing books at that point. I'd been started doing a lot of work as a tie in writer for a while. Um, I thought I took a little bit of break, but then in 2014, I got an email from JJA and it was very good timing because I had just like left my, I had been working at the Portland Children's Museum for like seven years or so. And I had just left them and I was just doing freelancing stuff. And he said, I can really use some more hands, like running my magazines. Can you come help me out? And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. That'll be fun. I apparently have forgotten, you know, how, what the weird world of publishing is like, you know, it, it, when you were in, when you work at a magazine, it's like, um, there's always some disaster happening. Um, and of course the cycle never stops. You know, it's like, oh yes, run, run, run as fast as I can to get this all done. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll start the next round of frantic work. And, yeah. uh, but I mean, that's kind of part of the joy and the, the fun. And we only have like the best people to work with. Um, so it's just been really, really terrific working with JJA and now like Adamant Press is like our big official name for all the magazines together. And yeah. it's just been a really exciting last few years working. It's kind of interesting because it sh kind of shows how, um, you know, because now you're taking over Nightmare or at this point you, you have taken over Nightmare. And yeah. it kind of shows how um, sometimes there are just these itty bitty opportunities in publishing that down the road become something a lot larger. Right. You know, you're like, yeah, sure. I will, you know, be an editorial assistant. And then one day you're like, wow, I never really set out to become a magazine editor and look at me yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually used to have a friend who would, who we were in a crit group and he was like, he'd read my crits and he'd be like, Arlie, you're a great writer, but you're an even better editor. And I wanted to slap him because I, you know, as a writer, that's not exactly what you want to hear. Right. <laughs> looking back, I'm like, damn, he called it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so speaking of which, uh, some editors are not writers um, or they were writers once upon a time. You are an active writer with over 30 short stories out in a number of venues and a handful of books. You have novella The Secret Skin coming up from Neon Hemlock in October. And you have novel The Deer Kings coming up from Journal Stone in August. Does being a writer impact the way you edit in, a spe in specific or important ways? And has editing changed the way that you write? Well, certainly I'd say that probably like the early time of um, when there was overlap between writing and editing the editing had a huge impact on my my writing experience because once you get started once you get started like reading slush i think that it can be a, a huge transformational experience for you as a writer um because it, it you just suddenly realize like what it takes to make a story stand out in the crowd right. and that is i think that totally changed my approach to writing and really made me level up my game a lot. Um, and then like, it's hard to know if being a writer impacts my editing or not. Um, Cause I feel like there's like, I've worked with a lot of editors, you know, I, actually I am on story number 49. I'm just waiting to publish one more story before I cross that 50 store, 50 stories in publication. And I, who knows wow. when it will happen? Who knows? Wow. Like, you know, so many rejections to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, you know, so I've worked with a lot of editors over the years and some of them 
like I just don't know what their process really is. Like some of them don't really edit. They're yeah. like, I picked the stories. I picked them because they worked. I don't need to do anything else because right. I'm happy. And some editors are like, well, this is a great story and it, it suits me, uh, but I want to work with you to do more with it. And some, some editors are even like, we're going to do a lot more with it. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I, I just think it kind of every editor, it's really a big part of like just personality, it, I think has more to do with it. For me, I think um, like at Nightmare, one of the things I wanted to be able to do. So for, you know, one of the things that JJA brought me on in 2014 with the magazines was to mm, handle most of the rewrite requests. Mm. Um, okay. Stories that were working a lot, but maybe, you know, like, uh, one of the first rewrite requests I ever did was with Sam J. Miller. He had this wonderful story, We Are the Cloud, but it actually didn't seem very science fictional in a lot of ways. So we went through and Sam and I worked together to like figure out like, well, here's a moment where he's doing this computery thing. How can we make that seem even more sci-fi, jazz well, hands? You know, um, and I really, really, really liked that. Like that was really fun. So in our first submissions period at Nightmare that I was leading, I found a handful of pieces that I thought were really unique or different or doing something that I thought was cool and that sh we should be seeing more in the genre, but maybe they didn't quite work or something. And then I, you know, did uh, much more rewriting than I think like JJA has done in the past. And in general, it worked out. There was just one, one story that didn't, I, I was hoping it could maybe translate over into a poem and it did turn into a cool poem, but it wasn't <laughs> quite the dream that I had, but I hope he found a good home for that one. But anyway, <laughs> so I really enjoy, I just love working with the writers so much. That's like my favorite part of the job. It's just great. Nice. Oh, hello. We seem to have one of our writers right here. I, I've been trying to leave my mic off, um, <laughs> to, like, you know, make sure there's no feedback or anything. But this is so fun because I have never heard this. I've never even talked to you before. So I'm like, wow, I'm hearing the background of the process. And oh, <laughs> it's it's already like the most interesting story I've heard all day, right? Like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, <laughs> so who is this? Uh, this is Maria. Okay. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi. It's so me. great to see your actual face and not just like, you know, read your typed words. <laughs> I I feel the same way. This is amazing because I, I follow both of you um, for some time now, actually, kind of spied on you uh, <laughs> in this very weird, stalkery way. Very appropriate for Nightmare, maybe. And so it's like, oh, wow, I'm actually talking to them. Like, what's happening? You know, so it's very cool. It's nice to see you. <sighs> They're real people, <laughs> normal people, oh, trying not to freak out. I've actually been like about to click the button to come into the room for like 10 minutes, like <laughs> click the button. Nope, you know, it's not 15 yet, but like how early should you be? So it's, it's yeah. <laughs> so Sorry. Maria, you have, um, you have in the beginning of me, I was a bird coming out the lights. Yeah. But yeah. the Cabot just appeared in Nightmare. Uh -huh. what, yeah. what is the Cabot about and why is it important to you? <laughs> This is so funny because I rehearsed an answer to this question and like as the screen was loading, I realized it was a lie and I was like, oh no, like what do I do? Because originally I was like, oh, it's like about how, actually I never can answer these questions. I have some friends that are academics and they're always given these really, you know, impressive answers about the self and like, you know, theory and whatever. Meanwhile, I'm like, well, I thought this was cool. So then I wrote it down. So it's always yeah. really embarrassing. But I think originally, my thought was like it was about youth and how when we're young we're often these like very messy people who um are still working on figuring out who we are and a lot of times there's so much judgment tied up in that where you know you're like i should be a certain way or i should be a different way but it was really funny because as this was loading i was like i have i'm still like that right like that doesn't go away i'm in the middle of this like weird friend breakup kind of and it's right. this person I really love and they really love me but we're like something's not working and it's so messy and complicated and things should be different and I'm like oh so this is still happening <laughs> like, <this is> not, <laughs> we didn't grow out of this at all hi yeah. so you know. oh hello 
I'm Hello. All good now. Who do we have here? <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Woody. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet y'all as well. <laughs> um, Maria, uh, yes. Send it to your comment about how you had this rehearsed answer, but it turns out it was a lie, and then yeah. oh, you yeah. kind of wrote this cool thing. I interview a lot of authors, and I do book reviews, blah, blah, blah. And once in a while, you'll hit a thing where I think that we just, as writers, we we write about stuff on a subconscious yeah. or gut level, and we don't always yeah. intellectualize the process. And so sometimes, yeah. sometimes I'll be like, in an interview, I'll say, oh, for me, this story was about this. And then the yeah. author will be like, oh, yeah, I think you're right. Like, I didn't really think about <laughs> it, but maybe you're right. Or they'll be like, no, that's not what I was writing about, you know, just depending. But that's like my whole life. Yeah, people ascribe a lot of intelligence to me that I don't have, where they're like, oh, yeah, I can clearly see these themes. And I'm like, sure, expressionism. And then I go home and like Google the word. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting, interesting, you know? <laughs> Right. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm so much more brilliant than I knew. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> so what, what was the hardest or most challenging thing about writing that story? And how did you deal with that challenge? This is such a funny question for me because um, so I'm actually a novelist more than a short fiction writer. I just started writing short fiction like a year ago. Yeah. Um, I've been doing like novels for like 20 years and um, I was on submission. And of course, submissions is a very slow process. And I was like, I got to do something with my time. So I was like, I'm going to write some short stories and nice. um, we can talk more later about how different that is. Um, and this was one of my first short stories. And it was the only one that ever just like came to me. Like I was laying in bed and I was like, like about to fall asleep. And then I was like, what if, and like the whole thing just kind of started. And over the course of like six hours of me going fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep, which I never do. I have insomnia, so I never do fall asleep. But I know that if I like give into this, I'm really not going to fall asleep. Yeah. So I'm like telling myself the whole time to fall asleep. And the whole the story is just writing itself. And so like after dawn, I like dragged myself out to my laptop and I'm like, all right, like I give up and I typed it out. So it's actually very easy to write. And I think it's because it's a story that's very honest, right? Like it's very um, unflinching about you know, like, again, how messy we are in terms of like, like there's sex in it that's not very sexy, right? And like, you know, there are complicated relationships with like peers and, and parents and all this kind of stuff. It made it very hard to sell though. And like, again, I was like this new short story writer, so I didn't know it was normal. The first place I sent it was Clark's World and they actually held it and I was like super excited, like, oh, okay, like I'm on my way, right? And then of course they didn't buy it. And then I went through this process of being like held over and over and over again where people were like, I really, there's something here but it's a little too dark, it's a little too graphic, it's a little too sexual. And I hadn't really thought of myself as a horror writer before this. And I called my friend and he was like, well, yeah, you're a horror writer. This is, yeah, of course. And I was like, <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by like, you're a horror writer? And he was like, have you read your books? Like, have you read any of them? They're all like horrific. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? Like, they're very normal. This is a normal circumstance. This is a normal thing to happen. And he was just like, no, like I, I, I have a degree in this and this is definitely <laughs> horror. And I was like, oh, oh, great. So that kind of helped me figure out where to put it, I think. Nice. When the, <laughs> when the Cabot came in, um, what made this story stand out for you? Well, for one thing, it has a really terrific voice, right? It's uh, really easy to read, yeah. uh, which is, is is great when you're reading like 1,200 pieces of, of fiction and you get something that you actually enjoy reading. That's, that in and of itself is like such a treat. This is amazing. Um, this is like my wildest dream, listening to Wendy <laughs> talk about my story. It's such glowing words. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> I also uh, went screaming when that like email came in. I was like, okay, like, time to put it in my rejections folder, right? Because it's been uh, a while now. And then like it was like, I love this story. And I was like, I had to call like that. Am I reading that? Like I had to go like ask like four people. Like, hey, is this what this says? Like I might be hallucinating. I have hallucinated before, so I'm just making sure like this is this is really happening. And then I was just like calling people, just like screaming. Like it's it's like your magazine. I mean, come on, right? Like oh, no. sorry, oh, I can't stop talking. Yeah. I'm nervous, and I just I can't oh, stop. No. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, oh, this is hilarious. Oh. I love it. Um, it's so hot. But yes. Why is it so hot? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I mean, another thing about this story is, uh, you know, Maria's lie about you know how it's about youth. It did. It really spoke to me a lot about what it was like to be a young person and. 
I feel like when you're young, there are just like so many things you could be or that you think you yeah. should be. And there's so many ways you try to make yourself conform to things. And I, I think that, you know, like I look back on my um, college years and they are horrific, right? Like <laughs> yeah. that's like the most horrible version of myself. I'm the most, yeah. It's just absolutely miserable. And yeah. I feel like that that um story just nails that. And, <laughs> and it has a wonderful treat, which is that it has like the cutest possible <laughs> animal involved in this horror. Oh my god, and this is horror. It's so cute, right? Like, I don't give away too much about this story, but the main character's boyfriend trims his fingernails in front of him. And <laughs> that is that oh fingernails. Oh god. Ugh. What I think uh, yeah, just the fingernails. <laughs> I love when I got your note where it was just like I love this right here. This is terrible. I was like, oh my god, Wendy gets me. Like Wendy really gets me, you know? Like <laughs> Do you do that, Wendy? I do that too. Like when I send edits, I'm like, oh, I love this light. Like I send a lot of positive. Oh, absolutely. Comments. Yeah. Uh, I'm I like, if really I love cool. something, I love to make a note about it. Or yeah. this was hilarious. Or this is so disgusting. You're my hero. You know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Sometimes um, my edits will be like 10 or 12 comment bubbles about how much I love something. And then one line of like, Hey, how about adding a oh. comma here? <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I want to. I want to go over to Woody real quick for yes, a minute. Yes, Woody. It's Let's so exciting to see you in real life. I love yeah. your shirt. Oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> One of the very few shirts that actually survived my move from New York to to LA. So nice. Oh wow! Cool. Wow, cosmopolitan. <laughs> like wow. So Woody, you've had two stories out with us now. In Lightspeed, you had My Children's Home, but more recently in the March Nightmare, you had A Cast of Liches. What is A Cast of Liches about and why is it important to you? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so, I mean, first off, thank you so much for, for having me on here and, and, and uh, letting me talk about my things. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a real honor. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that like at its base, um, you know, a cast of liches is really about like rage. I mean, for me, like that's kind of like where it sort of came from, um, and like how anger can kind of just become all consuming, uh, you know, for people of color especially. Um, you know, I mean, the you know the plot follows a, a young boy who is who's shot to death um, by the police, um, who is unarmed, um, and with the help of a mysterious order of liches. Um, comes to haunt all those responsible for his death. Um, so, I love um, this. I love this so much. <laughs> um, which, uh, yeah. So, I mean, like when I was starting out writing this story, it actually like I, I, I just something just happened that had absolutely nothing to do with with police violence at all. Um, during my day job, I work um, outreach um, with the homeless. Um, so I was I had a client um, that we had uh, been working for like two years basically to get him into a hospital um, and uh, who was basically, I mean, he was not able to take care of himself. We knew this, but we just weren't able to convince doctors of this. And we'd finally been able to convince a doctor that, like he was not a person that was able to care for himself. He was, you know, at this point it, he was a danger to himself and you know, he could die if he uh, stayed out on the street. Um, and we'd finally got him into a hospital. And then I got in a call like a month after this um, that he had one day he had just, got up and walked out and no one had stopped him oh. and no one had no one had uh you know tried to prevent this from happening which is you know against the the hospital's uh you know rules um so i just i felt like that situation i just felt so angry and just like so sort of overwhelmed um that weirdly like this story popped into my head um and i think the reason for that is is that i think like you know it's I mean, obviously, you know, police violence is a you know, horrific epidemic in this country um, and, you know, throughout the world. But I mean, I think that the reason why it becomes such a talking point for so many people is because it's the most sort of visceral example of how people of color are oppressed in this country. Um, and so that was sort of the, the basis for me when, I'm, when I was sort of trying to come up with, with how I wanted to approach this. Um, was just kind of like focusing on like the anger um, 
that uh, I think all people of, con of color in this, this country experience, you know, especially when we have to see like the same sort of thing happening on the news, you know, every week. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. And over and over. And, you know, I'm a lot older than y'all. So for me, it's been for decades. It's always yeah. the same shit, to be honest. But anyways, <laughs> so what was the hardest or most challenging thing about writing this story? And how did you deal with that challenge? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think for me, it was just sort of finding a way to approach the subject matter that um, gave the story like an appropriate amount of nuance. Um, you know, in, in, in a way that was also sort of fresh and exciting because I, you know, I think that for a lot of folks, myself included, um, you know, especially after the Chauvin trial and, and this newest wave uh, of killings that are, you know, cropping back up into the news again, yeah. um, you know, it, it, you know, it can be very triggering. Um, so I wanted to be respectful to that, um, but also sort of write something that I hope the people that kind of are experiencing that trauma could commiserate with at the same time. Um, so, you know, when I had originally submitted this story to, to Nightmare, um, it was still when I, when John was, was, um, was still EIC and, um, he had rejected the story, um, uh, specifically for that reason saying that, you know, that there wasn't enough nuance in the story. So I had to kind of go back and figure out how I wanted to approach that. Um, but when I had originally written the story, I, the, the liches were not in it. Um, huh. so it was only after I had gotten that feedback um, from John that I add the liches. And I think that, that the liches are really what allows for that nuance because they sort of represent this um, literalization of rage that can kind of uh, lead to sort of a, an, an ideological extreme, right? They, they represent, you know, what's gonna happen to the boy as, you know, his rage consumes him. And, you know, I wanted to ask the question of like, is that what we want for this character? Um, is that what winning looks like? Um, and I don't think that I really had an answer for that question at the end of the story. And I kind of wanted to leave that open to the, the reader's interpretation a little bit. Um, but it, I mean, it, it, ultimately it was sort of the liches that allowed for that, that nuance that I think that the story was, which was originally missing. Nice. Uh, Wendy, what, when this came in, what made this story stand out for you? Well, of course, uh, you know, Woody has a great way of writing. And once again, uh, it was a lot of it was the voice and just how compelling the story was to keep turning. But um, I also thought, uh, you know, we, we do see a lot of stories that are about violence and revenge at Nightmare. And we also see a lot of stories about undead stuff. And I love stories about undead things, but I'm really tired, I think, of not, okay, I can never be tired of zombies because they're rotten, disgusting, gross, falling apart, nasty things. <laughs> um, but I also think that all too often we use like undead things like zombies in particular as a way of like distancing ourselves from other kinds of humanity and saying like there are kinds of people that are okay to hurt and i think that that mm. has been the the main trope of the zombie story for you know mm. since dawn of the dead you know and even before that um but that has just been a growing huge thing and i felt like this story you have these liches, which are the undead. They're still gross, right? They're still <laughs> awesome, like gross. Um, but they're empowered, right? And they are these magical beings that are very exciting. And the story was like so opposed to that trope of, yeah, there are just you know plenty of Americans that it's okay to just go out and gun down, you know. Yeah. And I thought yeah, that's that's a great message. Plus that I mean, witches are disgusting, and also I mean, <laughs> I I I also I just like um, you know we we run a stories at Lightspeed about police violence. Violet Allen had a wonderful wonderful piece. Um, and so I thought, oh, how great to get this super cool package of like gross stuff I love, cool messaging, also talking about something that's like so important in our, our universe right now. And I got to work with Woody again. So it's like a real no-brainer. 
Yeah. It's cool that you mentioned voice for both of these uh, authors because I've read work by both of them. And I totally agree with you. I have, you know, I totally agree with oh, you God. Um, about the voice. They both have really great voices and oh, uh, very distinct, very strong uh, voices and perspectives. So we just broke yeah. Maria. I know. I think so. <laughs> this is a very emotional discussion so far on a lot of different fronts. It's like really, it's a lot. It's hitting me. So. Well, Maria, let's go back to you real quick, actually. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> So you've also been working at novel writing and submissions. So yeah. how has writing long form impacted the way you approach short fiction and vice versa? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think the easiest, well, I think there's a train. I think the easiest way to answer that is to think about how like relationships work. So a lot of times as a writer, you're kind of exploring yourself and like, you know, your relationship to the world um, through, you know, fiction and, you know, when you're young and you're, you're you maybe not so young and you're having a bunch of flings or something, you, you kind of reinvent yourself, you know? Yeah. I, I used to be a terrible liar. I'm glad I became a writer because it gave me like an outlet to where I could like lie without lying. And so it, it's not so bad anymore, but <laughs> I used to have this real problem with lying. And like when I was in my twenties, I would go to bars and pretend to be like people I wasn't, right? Like I'm like, oh, I'm from, you know, this other place or, you know, I speak this language that I don't. It's like, it's really, really bad. Don't ever do this. Um, but I was like, I was, I was trying stuff out, right? I was trying to see how I felt about stuff. And sometimes I would hit on something and be like, oh, wow, actually, yeah, I think I am queer. Like maybe I just don't really like Rachel Maddow a lot. Like maybe there's something <laughs> more there, you know? And um, whereas like novel writing is like very much like being married. I mean, like it takes a long time, you know? And if, I, if I'm really lucky and I'm like really in it, it can take a much shorter time. But I think on average, it's like a year to a year and a half to really get through the whole, idea, concept, draft, editing, blah, 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 if, you know? And so it's like, you know, you gotta wake up every single day. And so you kind of have to know what you're doing and there's a little bit less exploration because you have to have a clear vision that carries you all the way through. Short fiction, it's like, I mean, the this, this story that I have coming out in Lightspeed, like, I can't even tell you like, what point of view is it in? What tense is it in? I'm just doing whatever I feel like, I'm just having fun, you know? And it's clearly like, I'm, I'm clearly just having fun. Whereas like, you know, a book, you have to have this really cohesive, uh, thing to it. And then I think also short fiction, you can be a lot more like progressively experimental, I guess, like kind of talking about this conversation we're having with like um, police violence and stuff like that. I know that when I was on submission, the last, like, when I'm on submission, like I'm always on submission, it's terrible. <laughs> um, there's a lot of like commentary from um, editors that's just kind of like very clear that uh, it's 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 like can we can we make this like a little bit more like mainstream or more appropriate for certain sectors of the population that we don't have to like go into right now, whereas like short fiction people are more willing to take a risk because it's just one story right so I, I get right. to kind of be more in that space and be more authentic to that part of myself, um, yeah yeah That's a thought <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> yeah. so bad kind of kind of the fun thing is that I I personally feel like short fiction is the frontier you know it's yes absolutely. It's where you get all the great new ideas. It's where you can experiment. Yeah. It's where, yeah. you know, different ideas can be tested, talked about, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, yeah, great point. Woody, um, you also write poetry. So oh, cool. are there important differences between the way you approach poetry and short fiction? Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like when an idea kind of comes into my head, like, at least with like fiction writing, like I, I generally like feel like I know about how long it's going to be like, I feel like when I get the idea, like, I, I generally like know, like, okay, this is a novel. This is a this is a this is 5000 words. This is 1700. Like, like, I, I'm usually like not exact, but there's been a few times where I'm, you know, way, way off. But generally speaking, I feel like I usually kind of like, know about what package the idea is going to be at. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I feel like that. what's, what's interesting with like I love that. poetry though, and like prose versus verses, I feel like poetry just kind of like allows for more abstractions than fiction. Um, you know, I, I think that like, you know, what you were saying about, about, uh, short fiction versus novels is so true. Like where you, 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 you're, you're allowed so much more freedom to like experiment and kind of like do things that are different you know, when you're not asking someone to commit to, you know, a thousand, you know, you know, reading, you know, a hundred thousand words, um, where it's, it's sort of similar with, with poetry that like, 
because you know you're dealing with something that's like more bite sized it, it doesn't have to be as narrative driven like the tension within a poem you know can really rely you know, it, it can really be sort of propelled by um you know like uh the sort of like the difference between like two line breaks you know or um you know like how the diction of you know a particular word is like in conflict with you know that of other words in the same line or in the same poem um so in in that sense like i feel like you know what's driving a poem forward is is much more uh linguistic in a sense whereas like you know what's driving stories is much more narrative um i i, I don't know how many poetry ideas that i've had um you know that i'm like oh you know maybe this would make a good short story like usually it's like I feel like the idea itself is is you know like usually it's too it's too abstract it's too it doesn't like have enough like narrative threads to really tie it together. I don't know if that like completely answers your question, but no, it totally I, makes. I hope it gives you some some measure of insight. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, Woody Maria, um, thank you both very much for joining us. It's been really great talking to you too. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Woody. We publish poetry at nightmare now so you might consider us if you have a poem that oh, yeah. just seems a little creepy or something <laughs> <laughs> i love this well i uh, i just uh, i just published a chat book in uh, this past november so that that kind of took a lot of my poems uh, <laughs> out, of, out of my rotation so i'm just sort of now building my stock back up but yes. um, awesome. having said that yes i do have uh, i do have <laughs> some things that that i think that we can send your way Yay. I forgot to say the part where it was like an honor to be here. So before I leave, I just want to be like, yes, it was a big honor. Thank you so much. Like, yeah. It was so great to like see you both in, in like a real, closer to real life yeah. kind of thing. It was That's awesome. Fun. Yeah, it's cool. good to meet Thanks you. Thanks so much for yeah, thank you so much for us. Yeah. Thank you. All right, bye y'all. Bye. bye. <laughs> Gosh, they are so cool. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So cool. What, what did you think about did anything from that stand out? Anything you want to come back to before we move uh, on? I, I just kind of want to mention something that Woody said about poetry and narrative and stuff. And it's really interesting because we only, so we, when I edited Queers Destroy Horror, we decided to do poetry on that because I like poetry. Um, I wasn't the poetry editor on that because our assistant editor at Nightmare at the time was a really cracking poet. Like she was really great. Um, but it, like it's kind of amazing because the at both of our open submissions periods, we got we've gotten a lot of poetry that's like a story that's like in short lines. And it's like, right. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's so weird to me. Like I was definitely not really, sometimes that can turn out kind of neat. Like sometimes there's like great things that happen, but it's definitely not like what I set out for. Like when we say, yeah, we want to, we want to publish scary poetry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we, we already published stories. We, we want, you know, yeah. I love the way he mentioned that, like, the tension in a poem is driven by, like, diction and language. And because I love that. It's, and it's exactly what it is. And structure. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. I could listen to Woody talk about poetry for, like, another, you know, <laughs> month. I mean, like, like, he could have a little dissertation on here. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah. It, I love, um, I really love work that people get upset about and have arguments about, you know, uh, in, for example, specifically about what it is, where it fits. For example, I think of Rachel Swirsky's uh, If You're a Dinosaur, My Love, which people were so angry about, which was an absolutely fantastic story, regardless of, you know, what you think of it in terms of mm -hmm. it being speculative or not. Like for me, I don't care. It's amazing. I was bawling. Yeah, you know, but I love the fact that they, I love these moments when people argue about stuff and when they're like, no, it's this, no, it's that. We and we published um, Shingai's uh, flash fiction piece, Black Man's Flight, and it's exactly one of those pieces because we publish it as flash, but you can also look at it uh, through the lens of poetry. And some people, you know, people are having discussions about is it poetry? Is it flash? What does it mean that fantasy published it as flash and not as poetry? 
And I just, I really love that kind of stuff, which challenges you to, you know, examine your assumptions and question things, basically. Yeah, that's really um, cool. But, and shiny. Uh, yeah, but you said that you like poetry. So actually I wanted to ask you, because one of the changes you made at Nightmare was adding poetry. So why add poetry? Is this something you've always been into? Like, Well, I'm a really mediocre poet. Okay. And um, I, you know, I, I, I learned so much editing short stories. I thought maybe I could learn about poetry by editing it. Yeah. <laughs> and it would give me a great excuse to keep reading more of it, you know. Yeah. So it was mostly self-serving. Also, I thought, um, I don't know, I, we used to do two original short stories and two reprint short stories. And I didn't really like love the idea of having to just read all the time to keep up with reprints because the, uh, the world of horror publishing is, is large and broad and enormous. Yeah. And I'm really lazy. <laughs> I, I just kind of wanted people to send us stuff, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that sounds bad, but it was, it's like really self serving. But I kind of have to do that because it's like nobody else is going to watch out for my time. I've got, if I want to write a novel every few years or ever get that 50th short story out the door, then I have to be kind of smart about things. <laughs> Yeah, no, people underestimate how much time doing reprints actually takes. Because <laughs> yeah. you actually have to find stuff. And then, yeah. Um, so one of my favorite questions to ask horror folks, because horror is seen in so many different ways by different people. What do you get out of horror? What is it about horror that you love, which just isn't the same with other kinds of writing? Um, that's an awesome, awesome question. I, first of all, I think uh, I kind of talk a little bit about that uh, in, in a couple of places, like in Nightmares, like uh, January issue, which was JJA's last one, we had a conversation about uh, in that, about some of the things that horror can do that other genres don't. And that was really fun. And I also talk a lot about like my personal interest in uh, horror is dealing with like difficult stuff. And an essay I just had come out in Apex Magazine about nice. uh, I got really into be into horror literature when I was a kid. Uh, my best friend died in an accident when I was uh, in second grade, and it's sort of it was a place where you could talk about terrible things when I felt like you couldn't talk about terrible things in the regular world uh and that, that's a, a special thing that horror does it has this wonderful way of saying like okay here are some terrible things and it's okay to talk about them which you know you can't do very much oh look i'm getting emotional okay. uh you know when people ask you how you're doing you're supposed to say fine when you're when you pick up um a, a, a stephen graham's jones novel you can be like, you know, for the space, for the so for like the next half hour while I'm gonna read these two chapters, I'm not gonna be fine. And that's the job of this book is to let me not be fine for a little while. And I think that's very important. Um, it's also it's a great place to just practice. Like, you can practice feeling bad. You can practice being scared but coming out of it okay. I uh, you can practice being. It's a. I mean. Nobody should be a bad person, but when you're in a horror novel, you can kind of be a bad person vicariously and get that out of your system. And I think that's something really special. And, uh, you know, a horror can span a wonderful realm of, of it doesn't have to just be scary, right? Like, yeah. It's great when it is because it's fun to be scared sometimes, especially in a way that is mostly safe. But it can also like it's a great place to just delve into bad places like being really depressed and facing terrible things like the end of the world and, and stuff like that. And I think that's um, it's really special and important for us to have places like that. You know, we as a society take we don't like to be uncomfortable and 
Uh, we try to find ways to make ourselves as comfortable as possible and find ways to avoid discomfort. But I don't think that's necessarily healthy for people. And I don't think it's necessarily like gonna help people grow and be good people. So um, I think when you can find safe ways to be uncomfortable, it's it's good for you. Yeah. yeah. And fun. I vibe a lot <laughs> with what you're saying. Like, yeah, I I feel that extremely. Um, do you, so you took over Nightmare from JJA, John Joseph Adams. Um, so do you, but you also worked with him for a long time. Uh, do you see specific differences and this is kind of interesting that we just had Woody on who said, um, you know, that story was originally rejected by JJA and then he tweaked it and then you bought it. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, little coincidence with this question. Do you see specific differences between the things you like in stories or your taste from John Joseph Adams? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, we've worked together really closely for a long time and a kind of a, a part of why we work together so well is because our, our tastes tend to overlap so well. And, um, and of course, working with him so much has so greatly informed my own taste. Right. But I do also think like there are in the past, there have definitely been stories that I really liked that John didn't like as much. And when I think about those pieces, I think they tend to be a little bit more, uh, maybe, I don't know if literary is the right word, because he has great taste in prose and things. But I think I, I, um, yeah, my, what, I, I really like things that are a little bit philosophical or that um, wrestle with more intellectual, like things that have like an intellectual puzzling aspect to them. Uh, and I think that's a lot, that's one place where our tastes do diverge is that he's not, he doesn't necessarily love those as much as I do. That makes sense. Yeah. I feel like some of those things are like hard to put your finger on, but you, right, you, yeah. like you, you almost know it. Like, like sometimes in the slush pal, I, I see a story and I'm like, Oh, I think Christy's going to really like this, but it's not as much for me, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so what are your goals for nightmare? What do you hope to do with the magazine? Um, well, I mean, we're just kind of like, unfurling our wings and sort of seeing like what's what right now which is very very still like sticky all over from like the egg goo so i'm not 100 <laughs> percent uh sure if there's like any changes or big directions you know that we're gonna take or anything uh i just i really want to see uh you know i just want to proceed with as much like care and heart as I can. I mean, that's, that's my goal for the magazine is just to be, you know, a place where people like Maria can have their stories and feel safe to share them and feel like um, they can be their authentic selves while working with us. Yeah. And, and just like, you know, a huge priority for me is just like taking care of our writers and having them feel good about the experience. It's like really a number one experience goal for me. I mean, I want our readers to have a great time too, but I mean, I just assume they're hanging out with us and we're picking great stories. So I'm going to have a good time. <laughs> I mean, they're reading cool horror stories. What's not to love? What more could you ask for? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, there's gross stuff like witches and cute animals <laughs> like habits. I mean, how cool is that? So, I mean, I want to take care of our readers, but I want to remain focused on taking good care of our our writers and stuff like that. Kind of building community, because yeah. that's another thing for me is like I've always been I've been a pretty big horror fan my whole life, and you know like I live here in Portland, Oregon, and we have like the H.P. Lovecraft Festival where you know like thousands of people converge to well not thousands. But, <laughs> 
hundreds of people converge just to like be really nerdy and love you know ridiculous movies and books with tentacles and stuff like that and <laughs> getting to know all these people has been so great and i feel like that's a, another thing about horror that's kind of special is that you know it's a little smaller of a genre than science fiction and fantasy and you can get to know like basically everybody in it and it's like this kind of a, a weird extended family reunion wherever you go and i just like the idea of nightmare being like really a part of that and being a place that is doing good like you know sometimes family reunions can have like a creepy uncle who wants to put you in the closet and do creepy stuff to you and we want to be like that neat aunt that comes up and it's like well, leave that kid alone get the fuck out of here oh sorry. <laughs> also nightmare has a lot of f-bombs we're we're not very good about mining our, our language yeah us too. <laughs> Victor Laval actually calls Lovecraft that that uncle that you know is racist, and you're just like, oh, here he goes again. Yes. <laughs> He's as usual. He is right. He is a wise, <laughs> wise man. Victor is brilliant. <laughs> um, so, what would you like readers to know about Nightmare, which they may not know? Um, well, I just want to, you know, like I use that word like with heart and I think like that's something to be aware of about Nightmare is it's not just like that anthology that's full of, you know, scary stories. Uh, our stories are always going to be stories that are full of heart. You know, they're going to like touch you and give you good feelings or maybe not good feelings, but they're going to be about feelings and they're going to be about people. And, um, and I think that's what separates us from a lot of other horror venues is uh, just this, this emphasis on whole people. Right. That makes sense. Is there anything else you want to talk about or anything else you want people to know about you before we, uh, before we wrap up? Gosh, I don't think so. <laughs> We've had so much fun talking. It's just been great. <laughs> it was a good session. Well, Wendy, thank you so much uh, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed oh, thank it. Thank you for organizing uh, this, Arlie. It was terrific fun. My pleasure. I, I'm always thinking about uh, when we hung out last, which was a long time ago now. And I'm no. always like, oh, I miss Wendy so much. We need to hang out somehow. So. We do. Yes. Yeah. I I can't really, yeah. I can't wait till we can travel again and see <laughs> Me too. I'm really glad we got to do this. So fun. Have yeah. a great afternoon. Me too. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Bye. And thank you for joining us, everybody who watched. Bye.